God will never let a mouth be born that he can't provide for. I've begun in this morning's worship and I want to continue in this worship and for the rest of this month in a series of messages, a series of sermons that touch on and go deeply into controversial issues that are not being addressed and met head on by the pulpit in many churches because most preachers want to preach what draws a crowd and what excites people and and what dumps the house and makes people run but you're not ready for the good news until you've heard the bad news and controversy must be met head on because as a preacher, I must preach the whole counsel of God or I would be derelict in my responsibilities. I would be practicing ecclesiastically malpractice if I did not preach the whole counsel of God. So I began this morning and I want to continue in this worship. This morning we talked about what must the church say about abortion. Abortion is the topic today. What must the church say about abortion? And, and I don't have any political agenda. I just have a biblical conviction that the child is in the womb made by God. And then in the womb, the child is seen by God. And in the womb, the child is known by God. That's what the church has to say about abortion because it's not a political issue, it's a spiritual issue. And we must address this spiritual issue with the word of God. Since we know that the baby is a child of God in the womb because he told Jeremiah, in your mother's womb, I shaped you, I formed you, I ordained you to be a prophet. And over 37 million babies have been aborted in this nation. And that is immoral. But the immoral act does not make the person immoral. The action is immoral. I want to prove through you from the word that you can commit an immoral act and not be an immoral person. Because the gospel is not about making you feel guilty. The gospel is not about destroying and tearing down. The gospel says if you confess your sins, yeah, yeah. an abortion is a sin. It's not a choice, it's a child. Amen. See how quiet you got right there? I don't expect much shouting and carrying on. That's why I prayed the prayer because I know you'd shout when I pray. And that's why we sang Amazing Grace because if that didn't get you, nothing else would. I tried everything I could to get you to shout because I know this message will not do it for you. It's hard to listen to. It's hard to preach. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Open your Bibles with me in Ephesians at chapter number 6 because if we're going to say and do something about abortion it must be spiritual warfare because the battle is has to be enjoined in the spirit world because it is the spirit of the antichrist it is the devil himself who causes us to do things that are against the will of god yeah. ephesians at chapter number six and verse number twelve For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness 
of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Thank you. You may have your seats. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. There is noise on both sides of the political aisles concerning the issue of abortion. That is a hot topic in, in politics and uh, on, the, on the conservative right and on the liberal left. Uh, uh, abortion is a polarizing issue. Uh, people are on one side or the other. You are either uh, pro-life or pro-choice. Uh, I'm here today again with no uh, political aspirations. I have no political agenda. I'm not trying to run for office. I'm not on one side or another in this debate. I am on the Lord's side with biblical conviction. And my biblical conviction is that a child in the womb a fertilized egg by a male sperm is already a child at conception. Because God has already written that child's future in the womb. God has already decided that child's destiny in his mother's womb. God has already seen the future in the womb. God has already designed the eyes and the teeth and God decides on ten fingers and ten toes. God decides how long the hair is, how, how that child speaks and walks, the gait of his walk. God has already put all of that in his DNA because the parents have sexual intercourse to bring the child into a fertilized egg, but God knits and makes the child in the womb. I, I, don't, I don't back up from that. I don't apologize for that. I know what's being said. I know what the abortionists are, are saying. I know what's being said on the left and on the right, but I want to stay where the Bible is and the war that's going on is not a political one, but a spiritual one. And if we are the body of Christ, the only way we can do spiritual warfare is with the word of God. Now, I am not here to condemn a woman who has had an abortion. That's not what I'm standing here to do this morning. Because any sin you commit other than the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit can be forgiven. Abortion can be forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Men get quiet on this issue because men can't have abortions. But men make babies by women who have abortions for them for various reasons that I will get to in a moment. So what must the church do? We already know what the Bible says. We already know what the church says about abortion. But what must the church do about abortion? Since the warfare is spiritual, what must the church do about this issue of abortion? The first thing I think we ought to do is teach the truth. The child in the womb, listen to this, is a work and a wonder of God. Psalm 139 says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that my soul knows right well. God has given the church the right and the responsibility to insist that the baby is a child and not a choice. A created person and not a conglomerate of protoplasm. The New England Journal of Medicine, a prestigious uh, medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, says that once a woman has seen a photo of her baby in an ultrasound, 
she immediately bonds with that child though it has not yet been born. The New England Journal of Medicine says once that woman sees that child, the, the fingers, and even before that child moves in her womb, she already bonds with that child emotionally. That's why uh, the left is fighting because they don't want uh, Planned Parenthood uh, to show the woman an ultrasound because they know perhaps if she sees an ultrasound, yeah. she will bond with the child and will not want an abortion. Yeah. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. I mentioned to you earlier that because a person commits an immoral act does not make them necessarily an immoral person. Because you are not the sum total of your actions. Uh, uh, any one of us on any given day can make a bad choice. Amen. Any one of us in any given set of circumstances can make wrong decisions. Now, abortions usually arise from pressure from the man who does not want the woman to have a child. Now you would, you would usually think that abortions arise because of financial situations or abortions arise because women have so many children they can't take care of any more children. But, but something is maternal about a woman to make her want a child. And I want you to understand this. When the abortion occurs, not only does it kill the child, but it kills something in the mother. Because not only is the child a child of God, the baby a child of God, the woman also is a child of God. And we must not be insensitive to the woman who is herself a child of God. But it's not always for financial reasons. It's not always because she doesn't have enough room in her life for a baby. Because a woman has room in her heart for all kinds of children, even those who are not her own. But the pressure usually comes from the man who does not want a child. Either because he does not want to be embarrassed, or he does not want his wife to find out. I told you, it's not going to get any better, so you might as well. Uh, I hope you had a good time prior to the sermon. Or, or maybe it's some kind of situation publicly that he doesn't want to come out. So he pressures her not to have the baby. And then the pressure usually comes secondly, if it's a young girl, from the mother. Her mother does not want her to have the baby and so they plan perhaps without the father's knowledge or with his knowledge to go and get rid of the baby rather than be embarrassed we are worried about being embarrassed uh, we, we are worried about people finding out you who are my age and older can remember when girls got pregnant when we were young uh, they would send them out of town uh, she said her her cousin's house. She's at her grandmother. Uh, like Joseph in the, in the New Testament, he would put her away privately. Uh, they'd send the girl to the country so nobody would know that she had a baby. And then when she delivered, she'd come back and nobody was the wiser. But, but the shame is usually on the woman. But she didn't make the baby by herself. And, and, and the mother of the, of the teen who is pregnant is usually the one who puts pressure on her to get rid of the baby, to get rid of the shame. But there is an emotional attachment and a psychological attachment to a child that even though the child has been aborted, you can't get rid of that emotion. You can't get, of that, get rid of that psychologically in your mind. It not only destroys the child, but it destroys the mother. And in many cases, it destroys the family. It's an immoral act that does not make you an immoral person. And so we've got to teach the truth. We've got to teach 
abstinence. We've got to teach these young girls that you don't have to have sex before you're ready for it. Don't bring a baby into the world that you cannot take care of. Then we need to tell these young boys, don't put notches in your belt talking about how many girls you've gone to bed with. Then when you get married, you want a virgin. Am I doing all right? You want to sleep with everybody in your Sunday school class and you want to go with everybody in the choir and at the church and on your job, then when you get married, you want her in a white dress walking down the aisle pure and chaste when you were not pure and chaste. We've got to teach people the truth. If you get pregnant, don't compound the mess by getting rid of the child. Because God will never let a mouth be born that he can't provide for. Every child is a gift from God. Every child born is a child of God. And when that child is born, God is not shocked that he's here. Because God has everything to provide for the child. A word to those on the political right uh, who are pro-life and want the baby to be born and against abortion and you are, you are anti-abortion. That's, that's a good position. That's a good place to be. But politicians don't be against abortion and then write legislation to starve the child once it gets here. Don't, don't be against abortion. Don't be against abortion rights. And then once the child gets here, you cut a uh, head start. Uh, you, you, you cut funding for after school programs. Uh, you destroy communities. You destroy families by enacting legislation that keeps people in poverty. Republicans in here. Democrats in here is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's a God issue. And whatever is a God issue must be addressed by the word of God. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. My fight is not with a woman having an abortion. My fight is the cause that makes them make that choice in the first place. If the church don't want her to have an abortion, why don't we help her take care of the baby? See how quiet you got right there? No, oh, you made it. You take care of it yourself. Well, I sincerely believe it takes a village to raise a child. Because somebody helped my parents to raise us. My mother and father were not around us all the time. Somebody told them what we were doing so that they could correct us. Because there was a time when other people could tell your children what to do. Of course, that day is long gone now. Because parents will cuss you out for telling you what their children are doing. But there was a day when, when other people could correct you and get you in line. So if the church is going to say what the Bible says about abortion, then the church got to do something. We got to put our money where our mouth is. If you want the child to be born, then you have to provide a way to take care of it. And that is not the job of the state. The church cannot outsource her responsibility. The church cannot form out what God has told us to do. God has told us to take care of widows and orphans in their affliction. That's what the church ought to do. See how quiet you're getting again. We've got to teach people the truth. Not only must we teach the truth, but secondly, we have to preach grace. The, the abortion people say, uh, the doctor says, uh, they, they've seen on the ultrasound that the child has some kind of birth defect. 
or some kind of severe handicap or the child has Down syndrome or the child has some serious illness that's going to cost money medically for years and uh, they persuade the parents to abort the child. But now listen to me. This is grace. Because a thing is not perfect, does not mean it's not precious. I think I ought to say that one more time. Because a thing is not perfect does not mean it is not precious. Jesus loves the little children. All the little children of the world red and yellow black and white all are precious in his sight because if you want to talk about being born with a birth defect everybody in here was born crooked low down ready to run from God no good in our hearts there's no good thing in us no not one but because there are no perfect people in here does not mean in God's sight we are not precious people a royal priesthood a chosen generation a holy nation God chose you in your imperfections. God let you be born with all your issues. Listen, no matter how long you've been in church, you haven't gotten over all your problems. You're still stumbling. You're still falling. You're still making errors. You're still making mistakes. You're not perfect, but grace says... You are precious. When, 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 our, when our children are born, we take them no matter what they look like. I have, a, I have a member of my church at home who says when her son was born, he was so ugly that when people would come to see him, she said, he's sleeping. And she said she had to grow to love him because he's just such an ugly baby. She actually said that to me. And, uh, you know, when we are born, when your children are born, and then sometimes after they get to be teenagers, you wonder if you picked up the right baby from the hospital. They can't be yours. And then they make you mad enough to kill them. But then you love them enough to kill somebody about them. Because they are not perfect. But to you, they're precious. Now, if your imperfect child is precious to you, what do you think about God's imperfect children being precious to him? Not only must we teach the truth, and preach grace but we have to demonstrate finally love let me say something to you that hopefully you're going to go home talking about Norma McCorvey Norma McCorvey was the plaintiff in Roe versus Wade in 1973 that legalized abortion in this country Norma McCorvey was the plaintiff in the Roe v. Wade case, the landmark decision of the Supreme Court that made abortion legal in this country. And she was a staunch pro-life or pro-choice uh, person. She believed staunchly in the pro-choice movement. But now Norma McCorvey is a Christian. And she was led to Christ 
by a seven-year-old girl with a birth defect. Because as God would have it, Norma McCurvey worked in the Planned Parenthood office next door to a place called Operation Rescue that talked to women against abortion even though they were raped or there was incest or even though uh, the child had some, a severe birth defect. Operation Rescue, if the mother didn't want the child, Operation Rescue would take the child rather than let the child be aborted. And a seven-year-old girl named Emily led Norma McCurvey to Christ. She kept after her to come to church. She said it would be cool if you came to church with us. And Norma went to church and the light of the love of God was shared abroad in her heart. And Norma McCurvey being the plaintiff in Roe v. Wade is solely and singularly responsible for the death of over 37 million babies. But she is saved now and on her way to heaven. And the women who, who had the abortion could be in hell and Norma is in heaven. Because of the grace of God that is so radical and transformative that even though you commit an immoral act, God can still save you. Somebody here today who has had an abortion, God loves you so much that he will forgive that act and restore you to fellowship with him. Any man who's responsible for a woman having had an abortion, God will forgive you and restore you to fellowship with him. The gospel is not about making you feel bad. The gospel is not about making you feel guilty, but you've got to hear bad news before you're ready for good news. Yes, and here is the good news. The same Jesus who died on the cross for the babies yet unborn died for Norma McCarthy. Yeah. 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 He went to Calvary for the plaintiff in Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And she is saved now and is doing everything she can to talk women out of abortion. The grace of God is so transformative that no matter what you've done, God will forgive. Thank you for tuning in to A Call to Joy. It is our prayer that the Word of God has brought joy, strength, and faith to your life. We would love to have you as our guest at Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church, where we are exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. For your convenience, we have a 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship service every Sunday morning and 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. Lily Grove is located at 7034 Till Wester Street, Houston, Texas, 77021, or feel free to visit our website at www.lilygrove.org. Until next week, God has called us to a life of joy. <laughs>